There's something incredibly irresistible about a powerful V-twin engine. Marry that to a very successful super sport line by Aprilia of the RSV Miele, and what you get is this incredible RST Futura 1000. Just one of the best sport touring motorcycles ever made in my opinion with this gorgeous single-sided swing arm and these incredible lines. Stay tuned to find out what I think about this motorcycle, what I like and dislike about it. This is going to be probably the first comprehensive conclusive review on YouTube and stay till the end because I'll tell you how you can own this particular motorcycle which is increasingly harder to find. Let's do it. Bravo y dobrodošli, bon dia, bienvenidos, servus, willkommen, buenos dias, bienvenidos, greetings riders, Nick here with Pegasus Motorcycle Tours and Consulting welcoming you again to the channel, thank you for being here, I could not believe that a motorcycle like this, the 2002 RST Futura 1000 by Aprilia had no proper review on the entire site of YouTube, so I had to get one, I had to get to know it and here we are. So in this review, I'd like to introduce you to the motorcycle, give you all the facts, all the things that I like about it, all the things that I don't like about it, and then I'd like to introduce you to an idea, something novel that I had conceived in my own mind of how my viewers of this channel and, and really great supporters of the exponential growth over the last two years can benefit from the richness of the Southern California market for motorcycles. These bikes are so hard to find and a lot of the bikes that I have in my garage, I actually placed another video about my current garage including the nine motorcycles that I have, some of them fairly rare and new as well and I'd like to offer these bikes to my viewers first. Obviously I have to buy and sell just to keep sane and keep the wife supportive if not actively unsupportive of my addiction here so I have to go through them to get to know them and I'm just simply curious but I have these great motorcycles and I'd like to actually find a way for you as the viewer no matter where you are to benefit from these motorcycles so stay tuned till the end I'd like to uh, share an idea with you of how that's possible but let me first introduce you to the bike because when I was looking for this motorcycle over the last few years I realized there's nothing online that's all that informative to be honest on YouTube there's absolutely nothing worthwhile if you find something it's very superficial and not very detailed at all and I felt the need that that needs to change this bike deserves to be memorialized because it's just uh, one of the best motorcycles that definitely I've owned in this sport touring class now sport touring motorcycle means long distance comfortable touring, a little bit more of an upright seating position. Uh, you have the single-sided swing arm, which of course I really love, in the same class as the BMW K1200S, the Triumph Sprint ST, and the VFR800. All motorcycles reviewed on this channel, some of my most cherished and prized motorcycles that I've owned over the years. But this has to be one of the most fun ones I've ridden. Now, it's rare because it was only produced for a few years in the early 2000s starting in 2002. This year is a 2002 as well and they all came in these incredibly beautiful colors as you can see what the sun does to them when it hits it is just transforms the motorcycle into something so futuristic that's why the name fits all these angular edges of the bike make it really really futuristic looking. Now it's very polarizing people either love it or hate it. I love it. I think it's beautiful. To this day, I pull up and people cannot believe that this is a 20-year-old motorcycle and the paint just hits you. You can't deny that it's gorgeous. Here you have a motorcycle that became something to feed the need for a more stable, more comfortable sport touring bike based on the very successful Super Sport RSV Miele platform. So what they did with that motorcycle is take the engine and the frame, they detuned it, dropped it down by 10 horsepower, elongated it by about 20 centimeters and made, gave a more powerful alternator to power up all those potential toys that sport touring riders would inevitably add such as a GPS, phone charger, 12 volt charger, etc. Now the chief engineer behind this project, Pier Luigi Marconi, a name that should be fairly familiar in the motorcycling world by this time, he actually ended up leaving in 2005 
And it was with his departure and Aprilia's declining financial situations that the production of this motorcycle was unfortunately halted. But he had bigger ideas such as adding ABS and cruise control, but uh, all of that fell through the cracks. He ended up later working for Bimota and other companies as well. The engine itself is extremely pliable. It's very usable. There's power everywhere. That's just the nature of a twin in general. And this twin is no exception. You get that torquey uh, engine. I think it's got about 72 foot pounds of torque. So not incredibly a lot, but it's a very light motorcycle and it's, it really performs quite well with those numbers. Famous twin Rotex engine pushing about 113 horsepower. That's 100 and two let's say at the rear wheel at about 9250 rpm the rotex motor has two spark plugs per cylinder for a cleaner more efficient burn now what i dislike about this motor most is the vibration the ubiquitous twin vibration especially on this aprilia even besides its attempts to mitigate it with a patented anti-vibration double counter shaft it just doesn't do enough in my opinion you feel the vibrations all through your feet and to your hands and unlike other motorcycles from italy for example the moto guzzi another motorcycle that i own that vibrates quite a lot until you take off and then it smooths out you don't feel any of it it's probably one of the smaller motor motorcycles i've owned even though it's a big 1400 cc twin this one gets worse as the rpms climb very strange i would prefer that to go away as I'm revving the engine and as the engine is moving faster but unfortunately that's not the case half an hour gripping these uh, stock handlebars and your hand starts numb even though the position isn't all that aggressive again I'm five foot eight hundred and close to 80 pounds thanks to COVID and being stuck at home for most of it and uh, yeah I don't lean on my wrists too much I, I have no problems with taking a sport touring bike cross country uh, when it comes to back pain or wrist pain but with this bike I definitely notice my hand starts to get numb my right hand my throttle hand starts to get numb after not even half an hour of riding on this thing and that's the unattractive part I don't like how the engine vibrates if you had to explain it to somebody who doesn't ride it almost seems like there's sand in the cylinders uh, you know pistons are just grinding down uh, obviously that's not what's happening there's power everywhere but the feeling is very particular. You either love it or you hate it. I also own a fully custom 113 cubic inch. So that's around almost 2000 cc's of twin power from an SNS motor. And this is just a fully customizable, incredible chopper motorcycle that I own. And this thing vibrates like nobody's business. So it would hurt some riders to hold on to those handlebars. I don't mind that vi vibration. This is a different kind of vibration. It's, it's, it's similar to the feeling you get when you are taking down a runway in a big jumbo jet and you know this motor is uh, incredibly powerful to, to streamline this, this jet down, down the path at so, you know, how many hundreds of miles an hour, but you feel the wind hitting that uh, plane and you can tell that it's really fighting against that drag so you get that weird vibration all over the cockpit until the jet finally takes off so I don't know it's it's not a it's not a nice vibration is uh, if I can put it that way uh, obviously everything will depend on each individual rider maybe you don't mind that at all but to me that's probably the weakest part of the motorcycle and one of the reasons why I would consider not keeping it the power is substantial it's sufficient uh, the delivery is a little bit undesirable in in the sense that it, it vibrates just a little too much for it to be a comfortable long distance sport touring motorcycle but for shorter trips around town and in the canyons this bike will keep a smile on your face another very unique feature of this motorcycle and a few others mostly in the Aprilia line actually is the very beneficial dry sump lubrication system that's a system that uses a different reservoir basically the sump or the oil pan and it requires at least two pumps one scavenge one pressure pump what that does is it allows the oil to be located mostly in a different place of the motorcycle it does not necessarily have to be underneath the engine 
uh, where on a wet sump system, the oil uses gravity to drain down. There's other numerous benefits. There's more oil, therefore it's cooler when it circulates. It performs better under higher intensity conditions. Think of performance aircraft, like the Red Bull performance aircraft shows, or, or racing vehicles that undergo extreme Gs of force. And none of that oil actually uh, is affected by that so much as in a wet system where it could actually starve the engine even for uh, a split second. So the dry sump system actually offers other benefits, even such as sloshing. So the wet sump sloshes the oil around and there's this, uh, what we call basically a parasitic power draw. That sloshing of the oil tends to rob the engine actually of power because it has to, uh, it has to force uh, against that viscosity of the oil. None of that exists because in the dry sump there's a separate reservoir and the oil is actually pressured through the system. So there's uh, numerous benefits. Also it allows the engine to sit lower because there is no longer necessity for the, for the, the sump or the oil reservoir basically to sit underneath the engine to collect that dripping oil. So what that means is you can lower the motor, the most heavy, the heaviest part of the engine, and that lowers the center of gravity. So numerous benefits. Uh, only the other bikes that I've owned so far that use it is the DRZ400 by Suzuki, excellent adventure touring, uh, supermoto, etc. dirt bike, and the Honda XR650L, another excellent adventure touring bike, all bikes I've reviewed, and they place the oil in the frame of the motorcycle, basically, right behind the fork. Very, very interesting system. So this bike uses it as do most of the other motorcycles, if not all in the Aprilia line at that time. The transmission six speed gearbox, beautiful, absolutely beautiful, crisp, clean. What really I love about the transmission is that even in first gear, you climb up to almost 6,000 RPM before you wish to put it in second. And that just, it's great. You can just take off at a red light and you're well ahead of everybody. You get that power, you get to enjoy the motorcycle and all that power behind the V-twin 1000cc engine. And you don't have to shift too early. And if you shift at five and a half, 6,000 RPM, it's smooth. It's almost like that's where it needs to be. I love it. It's, it's really a great, great motorcycle. And you do get this pneumatic power clutch. What it is, is a, a different way to mimic a slipper clutch. What a slipper clutch does, it allows slippage. So for example, when you are hard in a corner and you're downshifting, you'll notice a lot of times in these more powerful motorcycles, you'll downshift so fast and all that weight transfers to the front that uh, the rear wheel doesn't have enough traction and it starts to slide. That could be deadly in a corner. So hard downshift where you slide the rear wheel could be very, very dangerous. The slipper clutch or in this case, the pneumatic power clutch, which mimics that slippage, slips the clutch a little bit, and all that power that's being transferred to the rear wheel gets uh, taken out a little bit so that the wheel doesn't have a tendency to do that. Super smart, I love it, I love it. I remember my Suzuki SV, every time I would pull up at a red light kind of more aggressively, never mind in corners, I would slip that rear wheel. So this is very, very smart, just awesome technology. <laughs> The suspension of this motorcycle is a beauty. It's probably one of its strongest features. What you have in the front is a inverted 43 millimeter Showa fork that is fully adjustable for preload and rebound. The same is true with the Saks rear spring and very easily you can adjust this thing with the provided tools and a little screwdriver at the bottom of the shock itself. When you take this motorcycle in the canyons, you have full control. You feel everything what that wheel is doing. Now, if you watch my BMW K1200S review, you realize that in that motorcycle, they tried something different. They tried the telelever in the front. It's a whole new system, well, old, new, not used very much, system of suspension. And I like that a lot. There's no dipping when you're under heavy braking. This motorcycle doesn't behave quite like that, but you do have the benefit of the inverted forks. Of course, the inverted forks will have less of a bind, less of twisting uh, due to the heavy part of the fork being up top, which is more rigid. The brakes itself 
phenomenal. Also one of the stronger features of the motorcycle. You got a two piston Brembo uh, floating disc, 300 millimeters, 298, something to that effect. Absolutely stunning. Like I said, uh, no ABS because of the chief engineers uh, uh, leaving the company who had that in mind in, in later models. Uh, but never ABS on the Futuras, unfortunately. In the rear, you have a, what is it, a 255 millimeter brake that does the job basically, but on the left side of the wheel so that you could see this beautiful cast aluminum rim. A little dated in design, I think, but still quite attractive. You got a 5.5 plastic tank for those long trips that gets you around 160 miles of range at about 42 miles a gallon. That's the average. I get a little less by just in virtue of how spirited I ride. Uh, that's what it's for, to be honest. The interesting thing is you get the filler cap a little bit to the right, so it's not symmetrical. It's a little bit to the right, and the idea behind that is that you get a tank bag strapped on, of course, because it's plastic, so no magnet, that you can put over on one side without the need to remove it. That's very smart because my magnetic tank bags, I would always have a tendency to take off, put on the little area that's next to the pump. It would collect shavings, metal shavings, and, and all kinds of dirt, and then I put it on the tank. Next time I take it off, it just scratches the hell out of that tank. So I don't mind the fact that it's plastic. Obviously, it's lighter, just like the Triumph Sprint. It doesn't rust. The main problem with plastic tanks is that they tend to uh, expand with heat. And with that, they tend to peel the lettering. Here you have these actually looking like pink lettering of the Aprilia. On the middle, you have world champions, 92, 94, 95, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 2000. Pretty, pretty impressive. Tank, yeah, gives you a lot of range, which is the whole purpose behind a sport touring motorcycle like this as well. You have these grab rails. Another part that I really dislike and I've been surprised by, because they're plastic and they feel like if you yank down hard enough, you could rip that straight out. I don't mind the rear, the, the look of the rear tail light. It's all there, it's very visible, it's very unique. It's quite attractive still, even though obviously it's not LED or anything, halogen. But um, yeah, the grab rails are just plastic. You can hear them uh, squeaking. Uh, that, that definitely needs to be much, much stronger, in my opinion. What I noticed as well, the foot peg, this little plate here is too short. My, my, my uh, heel of my boots gets caught in this little area here, and sometimes it catches me off guard where I have to, you know, go to the side to take my leg up. So that's something that could have been thought through a little more. Not everybody who's going to sport, be sport touring on this motorcycle is going to wear racing boots you know i have motorcycle boots but they're they're almost like work boots and they have a lot of space between the leather and the the rubber and that rubber piece tends to catch here you do of course have a center stand something that's honestly should be basic equipment on all sport touring motorcycles you just need to be able to loop the chain and, and just perform that basic maintenance on a motorcycle like this so you get all the amenities of sport touring and the fun factor of super sport riding and that canyon carving on the weekends. This bike just keeps a smile on your face. I think it's definitely one of the best motorcycles ever made. You get these big, awkward looking mirrors. One of the actually weak points of the motorcycle is that the mirrors tend to vibrate. On this one, they're still okay. They don't vibrate. I've test rode a few other ones where they were so vibrated you couldn't see through them. They, they just were not useful. The air protection on this motorcycle could also have used a little bit more improvement. For one, you don't have a lot of protection here for your legs, so you catch a lot of wind there. Uh, it also makes it very loud, not, not obviously in your knees, but I don't know, something about this motorcycle uh, that has to do with how it takes the air uh, is, is not ideal. You have a big channel here, and I think that that creates a lot of noise. It feels like anything above 110, 115, and it gets a little exciting, maybe a little too exciting, just because of the air. The air is doing its thing. You don't quite feel as stable, I dare say, as you do on the K1200S BMW, for example, just because that bike is oval. It's meant to take the air a little more in line 
with what the air wants it to do. This seems like it's cutting through the air. It's, it's fighting it. All these sharp angles and, and the lack of protection for your legs and these, these really, really wide and, and angular mirrors, they seem like they're not really working with, with uh, uh, what the air is doing. Like they're, they're combating each other as opposed to the K1200S that feels like it's actually working with the air. Like it's part of, of, of the atmosphere almost more so. So I feel like this bike definitely could have used some more air tunnel time and testing to make it a little more aerodynamic, but I guess that's what you sacrifice for, to get that look, right? So I understand in the United States, North America, there's nowhere you can actually ride this thing a buck 40 legally, let's say, but you know, it's meant with the top speed of a 180 on the clock, supposedly 145. I can't comment on that, I never took it that fast, but uh, I did, you know, ride on the Autobahn in Germany between Munich and Berlin. Uh, got there in, in just over four hours, just flying the whole time. That's what these bikes are made for. I want to be able to go 140 and not feel like I'm on the edge of existence. And I feel with this motorcycle, the higher you go, everything above 110 just feels a little too loud, too awkward. It doesn't feel like you're you're cutting through the wind like it should. So that's one thing that I would say about the fairing. But again, the paint is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I don't like how these bolts seem to be pressing on the fairing. And if you ever look at it in the sun, it seems like the fairing is paper thin because these holes here tend to be indented. They're actually quite, it's quite a strong fairing. So I think that's a design. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I've noticed that on every Futura that I've seen that this this little area around the bolt seems like you either torqued it down a little too much but that's in fact not the case so here you get a little bit of a visual of the cat that was placed underneath uh, quite a beautiful beautiful piece of equipment underneath there and you have the fan uh, on this side of the radiator there's another one on that side and the oil cooler in the middle futura was released in four distinct colors the ash gray which is more like a matte black beautiful very very attractive muscular color on this motorcycle you have the stream gray which is a lighter gray nothing too exciting to be honest infinity blue or blue infinity kind of like a dark midnightish blue and this my favorite fire red which is aptly named because in the sunlight, this thing just comes to life. Absolutely gorgeous color. Probably one of the best looking motorcycle paints that I have ever owned. I find them very beautiful. I think this fairing is quite attractive. It's very heavy. It, it gives me a sense that it's a quality built fairing. It comes in two pieces, which is nice because if you ever damage one part, then you don't have to replace the whole thing. So this piece comes alone after this piece uh, comes on its own separated from the air intake so it's it's an attractive good quality fairing the seat you'll hear this from all owners of the Futura probably the most comfortable seat that you've ever sat your ass on it's incredible you can go 600 miles in a day not feeling a thing it's wonderful and you get the shape that prevents the pillion the passenger from actually slamming into you the rider because there's a little dip and a little horn here so i, I really love the seat just an incredibly comfortable seat very large all one part actually comes out with this whole piece of plastic right here but there's no room underneath it that's because marconi the engineer uh, worked really really hard to get this exhaust to run underneath the motorcycle and that's why you got the cat all the way underneath the bike and the exhaust runs deeply under the, the underside of the motorcycle, underneath the seat. Uh, so they had to work a little bit harder to make sure that the rider and the passenger didn't feel all that heat from, from the exhaust. The exhaust itself, also one of the parts that I dislike most about the motorcycle, aside from the vibration, you can't hear it. You can't hear it, and even when you do hear it, it's not very beautiful in tone. It's, it leaves a lot to be desired. I like the triangular look, but it's just super quiet and not very nice to hear. You want to hear your motorcycle growl, you know, and, and this, this leaves a lot to be desired, absolutely.
I forgot to mention, the seat itself is about 32 inches of height. So I, I really love the seat. Although the, the position for the rider, dare I say it's a little bit cramped. I'm only five, eight, hundred and whatever, 80 pounds. I'm not, a, I'm not a large man, but I feel a little cramped when I go in full tuck on this motorcycle. I can't quite uh, fit underneath the, the clear windscreen, so I have to pop my head up so I can see. So I, I just don't feel completely comfortable in that position. Now let's talk about the problems. The main, most known common problem of these motorcycles, and unfortunately some of the other Aprilias of that era, has to do with the electrical components. Mainly the regulator rectifier, which converts AC power to DC, actually DC to AC, that's usable by the motorcycle, is prone to failure. So that's one part. It's not terribly expensive and it, it just gets worse with age of the motorcycle, but uh, you'll know when you have weird electrical issues like I'm having now with the dash. Actually, that's another issue. The dash is very poorly soldered. So there is some uh, soldering issues in the motherboard of the dash that there are instructions online on the various owners forums where you can where you can do that yourself if you feel comfortable with the with the soldering tool but those are some of the two main issues that this bike was unfortunately known for but since we're talking about the dash it is a very attractive dash obviously from that era it almost looks like a fighter jet dash and you get a lot of information the dash is i find attractive although it is dated very very square in design you have the speedometer to the left and the tack both analog in the middle however on the right side there's a digital display called the engine control diagnoses and this gives you some information about the engine and what, what's going on even with the ambient temperature uh, along with a gas gauge the coolant temperature and yeah mileage is also given in digital form uh, everything else is really, really easy to see, even though it is analog. I prefer motorcycles with a digital dash if it's attractive enough. Just because motorcycles like these with a ton of power, if you're going fast, you are raising that mileage per hour so quickly that almost the analog can't keep up. And it's just very difficult to see. You have to kind of peer down when you're really flying and it doesn't feel comfortable staring at the dash. But if you have a big digital clock that tells you in big numbers what you're traveling at at the moment, I think that's a little more useful for motorcycles like these. However, it does light up very nicely, this beautiful blue tone. There are three warning lights on the top of the dash, fairly large and easy to see. One is the check engine light. The middle one is a kickstand warning light that is orange and the right one is the EFI that flashes red if something is not in order. You have one blinker light and that's located in the left top of the speedometer dash part and it just uh, is controlled by both blinkers all at once there. Uh, I did notice that as opposed to European or Japanese motorcycles the, the far light and the low beam is inverted. So the far light is the bottom and the low beam is the top. But you do also get a very useful passing light, which I think should be now standard on all motorcycles. The clip-ons are very, very comfortable. They look pricey. They look like good quality material craftsmanship and function. And I do like the levers because both levers are adjustable. You have four levels of adjustments available for both your brake and your clutch lever, both of which are hydraulic. So no cables here. Oil is checked on the left side of the fairing. There's a little window that you need to remove. We are uh, an Allen uh, wrench basically, or, and uh, you can access the reservoir. The same applies on the right side, except there you will access the overflow reservoir for the coolant. I have these aftermarket rubber pieces here to prevent your knees from scratching the plastic okay now about the luggage you know i'm a luggage freak when it comes to sport touring motorcycles uh, another main reason why i always wanted to own one of these 
it's just that it's so utilitarian and so beautiful to have a very capable sport motorcycle with matching luggage. Now, this luggage is also utilized in the Capo Nord, another awesome Aprilia. Now, I've been trying to research whether they are fully compatible and the verdict is still not out. I'm not quite sure if it's only uh, compatible one way. So the Aprilia luggage can fit on the Capo Nord, but not the other way around. They are the same, but the brackets seem to be adjustable in some respects. So I don't know, before you decide to purchase one or the other for your motorcycle, just be sure uh, if you can to actually see them in person, see if they fit. But the luggage has the standard locking feature on one side and on the other side it enables you to remove the luggage from the vehicle let's first open it that's what it looks like it can fit a full-size helmet in there you do get these convenient straps to hold things in place and you get these unfortunately cheap and prone to failing plastic cords that keep the door of the luggage case from swinging out on the other side it's actually broken uh, here where the ring hugs around the bolt i noticed that same problem with my jivy cases as well maybe even the same producer who knows they look very very similar on the inside so very very interesting design again very angular triangular just unique for sure so turn the key the other way around and you get to actually remove it from the motorcycle you turn it you press it and then there's actually on the on the Aprilia here you see a little latch that also acts as a safeguard to prevent the luggage from falling on my other one that latch is gone because it's not really made in such a way that it could withstand 20 years of use apparently so that latch is gone but it's not exactly you know completely necessary in that regard so when you release that, you press it down and when you press it down, it allows this latch to open and there you have it. That's what the luggage looks like. It just has these two notches that go inside. Uh, I like that. I don't like the big plastic rail that you find on motorcycles like the S, uh, ST1050, the, the Triumph Sprint. So I prefer not to have anything visible. You can have the bike without that you know you just have these two latches and this one here that that uh, is the place where the luggage actually locks so that's what the motorcycle looks like without the luggage um, I don't know it's uh, I find it more attractive with the luggage actually just because I feel like the seat is very big it's uh, very big and overpowering and I think it just detracts from the look of the motorcycle uh, i think there needs to be a cowl unfortunately a seat cowl was never produced not to my knowledge in any way so i do prefer the motorcycle with the luggage installed in the rear you have these little what you would call these grommets i'm not really sure pressure plates they don't really do anything but there was another bracket here that a well, flexible kind of like a rubber band type of bracket uh, I'm not sure what the point of that was unlike the Sprint ST where this whole lever moves left and right to accommodate the moving luggage this one doesn't it's just a rubber piece that prevents the luggage from doing what exactly I'm not sure but that's missing and as you can see on this side as well that piece is also missing that hugs to the rear but no matter it does the job the only other twin that i remember being so satisfying in this sport version with the full fairing is the suzuki sv 1000 s not a motorcycle that has oem luggage unfortunately but i love that motorcycle there's something about a twin engine on a sport bike you know and unfortunately i had a gorgeous red one after selling my 650 yellow one after about six days it's just underpowered I find a red one in another state I go get it fully fared triangular Yoshimura exhaust in the rear uh, I get caught up with the lady one night on campus library closes late night of course reading what else do you do in a closed library 
I come back to my bike the next morning around five, six o'clock. It's not there. Some drunkard hit it on the main avenue in front of campus, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and shoved it underneath another car. Cops came, of course, lifted that car up. Tow truck took that motorcycle. I think it was a $900 bill for me to retrieve that motorcycle. The minute they came for that motorcycle, another one was delivered to me from Ohio, and this one was actually gray, silver. Beautiful, beautiful motorcycle, uh, naked as well as fully fared. Thank you for watching. I hope this review has been informative and true to the very awesome nature of this incredible timeless motorcycle. In the description of the video, you'll find a original PDF version of the brochure and the maintenance manual, 360 pages of invaluable information for any owner, as well as the parts list. So take a look at that. Now, in the beginning of the video, I told you I have a very novel idea to share of how my viewers can not only support this channel, but benefit from all these amazing motorcycles that the very rich San Diego market has to offer. This is how. I think that the best owner for this motorcycle should be somebody like you, somebody who watches this channel, supports it by commenting. Again, I learned so much from you from the comment section. That's the main reason why I started this channel, which I consider to be an educational endeavor for all of us involved. So I'd like the next owner to be my viewer. The way you can do that, if you like this motorcycle or any motorcycle that I review from now on, go in the description of the video, click on the Patreon page, become a patron. You can do that for as little as a buck a month, nothing. A buck a month makes you able to make an offer on this motorcycle. Through Patreon, send me a message. It's all private, it's protected, it's only between you and I. And uh, tell me what you think this motorcycle is worth to you. If you are the highest bidder, let's say bidder, because we're not really bidding, but if, you, if your offer is the highest, you will get the motorcycle. If there's a higher offer, then that person obviously deserves to get the motorcycle because they value the motorcycle more. It gives them more value, it deserves to go to them. So there will be no back and forth, no, no any kind of uh, haggling. Whatever you think this motorcycle is worth to you, make me an offer. If it's the highest, it's yours. You have one week from the posting of this video to do so, and that's why it's beneficial for you to subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so that you can be informed when these videos come out. I hope that's a fair and just way for the viewers of this channel to benefit from the very rich market that Southern California has to offer. Thank you again, in any case, whether you do or you don't, for being here. I really appreciate your comments. Uh, there's other ways you can support the channel, that's one. Uh, the other way is purchase our gear, really handsome, nice, functional motorcycling gear. And uh, yeah, be, be a patron of this really, really growing organic channel that's independent. That's something we strive uh, most of all to be honest, independent, and correct in the information that we share. Thank you again until the next one. Nick, I'm out. Thank you.